This is the Clarence, the Waiatoa, a truly wild river in a setting nothing like the rest of New Zealand. I've wanted to journey down this river ever since I first climbed the peaks above it 40 years ago. I've often surfed the coast near its mouth north of Kaikoura, but I've always dreamed of travelling the length of this shimmering river through its Himalayan-like landscapes. This is my sacred river, the one that connects my love of the mountains, wild landscapes and riding the waves at the ocean's edge. I'll be travelling from the source of the Clarence in the Spencer Mountains, downriver past New Zealand's largest farm and through the Kaikoura Ranges before arriving at the river mouth on the South Island's east coast. My journey starts with wilderness writer and tour guide Andy Dennis and a stiff climb up the flanks of Mount Princess. Beautiful mats of gentian here. Absolutely stunning. Oh, yeah. For me, this is a return to my roots. I've come back to relive my first mountain climb of over 40 years ago, from where I looked down on this river and dreamed of rafting it. Weather's clagging a little bit. It's held off a bit better than I thought it was going to today. This is going to sound funny, Andy, but actually it's slightly easier than I remember. I'm not even sweating that much. <sighs> Starting to make me puff a bit now, Andy. Ah, oh, yeah, it's still good though, Craig. Yeah, true. <sighs> I'm at the summit of Princess, over 40 years later. 40 years I've been reading about people climbing mountains, and I don't think I've still adequately explained, I don't think anyone's adequately explained why we climb mountains. I mean, it's tiring, it's hard going, sometimes the weather's a bit marginal like it is here, but I guess it's extraordinarily beautiful, and uh, it's that beauty which really lifts me. It's not something that man can make, nothing that we can see out here is man-made, it's just a, a natural beauty. The Clarence starts high up here in the mountains above us, then wends its way down the valley to Lake Tennyson. Look oh, it's this. lovely down there. Nice, those little patches of beech forest still in this very dry country. There's a few loose rocks through here. Gravity assisted descent. <laughs> it's a steep climb down past the Princess Bath to the lake. This is another nostalgic spot for me. As a student, I used to drive 150 kilometres from Christchurch after finishing lectures on a Friday to come tramping here. While I stop to take photographs, Andy goes in search of plants. Lake Tennyson is a scenic reserve, a great fishing spot and a wetlands area with a wide range of plant species. And Andy's just found a rare one. I think this is actually Hebe salicornoides. Salicornoides. Thank you. Pronunciation is <laughs> always difficult with those Latin words, but not a, um, there are not many of this plant. But here it is. It's, it's looking so healthy. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's not it's booming healthy. along beside the red tussock. The yeah. rare whipcord Hebe, the Lake Tennyson whipcord Hebe. We Absolutely. A very rare plant. But even here, our biodiversity is under threat. There's a beautiful little myosotis, myosotis long eye, that it's in a book now because it's extinct. Last seen in 1912, just on those slopes over there. And I think it's extremely sad that we lose a plant in our own lifetimes virtually, that things go extinct because of something we've done. Komodo. Oh, it's James, more James Bond, really. It just doesn't uh, surf again. For the next leg of our journey, we're switching to a different mode of transport. Mountain bikes are getting very high tech these days, and this one's got me a bit confused. Having mastered the technology of a new mountain bike with so many gears I can hardly handle it, I'm off down the Clarence. With a good track, this is easy mountain biking country. This area may seem remote, but it's had a long history. Firstly, as a way between the east and west coast for Māori searching for Panamu or Greenstone. Then, as a stock route between Nelson and Canterbury for early European settlers. But it's got an even bigger claim to fame. 
Counts River actually comes through and borders the largest farm in New Zealand, an absolutely massive farm called Molesworth. It's 180,000 hectares. That's a whopping 1,800 square kilometres of farmland. And it's a conservation success story. Over 60 years ago, four neighbouring high country leases were bought by the Crown after being overgrazed by sheep and rabbits and repeatedly burned. With careful management, those problems are slowly being overcome and the sheep replaced by 10,000 beef cattle. Molesworth is now both a conservation area and a working farm. And Andy is on the Molesworth Steering Committee. About a quarter of those 180,000 hectares, Craig, are areas that are recommended for protection. Some of them have been fenced off and some of them they're trying to protect by easing back the grazing pressure. My hope is that over the next few years we will see a steady recovery of key ecosystems. Further downstream, it's time to get onto the river itself. The currents comes from Lake Tennyson where we've been and the Acheron joins it here. They're both actually in fact part of the Clarence because even tributaries that are named are part of the main river. And this is where we get enough water in the river to take off on our raft trip, which I'm really looking forward to. It's one of the longer rafting trips that you can do on any river in New Zealand. It's also through an area that just has so few people through it. I mean, they're only gonna pass one farm on our whole five day trip. This is us for the next uh, five days. This Andy and I are being joined for the journey by water conservationist Eugenie Sage. And first up, we're briefed on the trip by Bridget from Clarence River Rafting. As you can see, an awful lot of wiggles and twists and turns. There's no straight line on this river. When we've finished the trip, when we're out at the beach here and we're looking back this way, we're actually going to see most of those huge mountains again. We're going to see... In the capable hands of Bridget and her offsider Geordie, we head off on our 215 kilometre journey downstream. Rivers are graded from one to five, with one being the easiest. The Clarence is a grade two, so we're expecting gentle paddling with the possibility of an occasional grade three rapid. Most of the big rivers on the South Island's east coast have been dammed or tinkered with in some way. The Clarence is one of the last great untouched rivers in this part of the world. So it's a privilege to be able to journey down it and experience a landscape which has barely changed in thousands of years. Yeah, what an end to an extraordinary day. I actually started on the top of Mount Princess this morning and I'm rushing crazy now just to catch this last bit of light because there's this beautiful soft evening light that you get I guess on this dry country, on the barren country, on the east coast side, and it's just lighting up this hill like magic. And I mean, I've shot photographs like this for 40 years, but I never ever lose the urgency or the desire just to capture that last little bit of light of the day or the first thing in the morning. Um, it's just like a desire, it's just something that pulls me to do it and I guess I'll go on doing it as long as my feet carry me, as long as my camera's work, as long as there's film for the camera and as long as, and there always will be landscapes like these. There are idyllic camping spots all the way down this river. And while our guides get the fire and dinner going, there's just the small challenge of putting up the tent. Hey Andy! Yeah! A uh, little bit of complexity here. Selfie expert on putting up tents, Andy, so he can come across and help us. Uh, no, those old tents with one pole in the centre, things have <laughs> developed somewhat since those days. How old is your tent, Craig? <laughs> Now what you do That's is you amazing. bend these over and you'll see a pin in the corner. Yes. And the pin goes in. Yes. Yeah, so do that. Where did you learn that? Ah, at primary school, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> this is brand new tents, I think. They've yeah. done us the honours of giving us some brand new tents. Ah, Good. yeah. Pick up my tent and walk. Pick up my house. Biblical about that. Yep.
With the accommodation sorted and the sun going down, it's dinner time. I'll spare the soup. Thank you. All right. Andy. And camping doesn't get much better than this. This is an absolute delight. I mean, I'm eating out of a clean bowl. I'm sitting in a fold-up chair, and I'm eating miso soup with great additions. I don't think we're going to starve on this trip. There's nothing quite like waking up to a billy breakfast around the campfire, especially when you're camped miles from nowhere beside one of our most beautiful and unspoiled rivers. Well fed and rested, we're ready for another great day on the Clarence. Today we may even find some white water. Once again, we're in the capable hands of our guide, Bridget, and she soon makes it clear who's boss. OK, and everybody go forward again. Now just keep going forward. Very nice. You seem to be a bit of an autocrat in the back of this boat here. I mean, we're brought up on democracy, you know, we're taught at school to, you know, treat everyone's opinions as equal and to uh, make a group decision, reach a consensus, uh, have a discussion. Yes. You know, that's the New Zealand way, and you, you seem to be a bit of an almost arch fascist in the back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do well, you feel well, about well, this sort of I'm actually, dimension? I'm actually fairly comfortable with it, Craig. <laughs> you guys are the engine, and I'm the yeah. steering wheel. Uh -huh. And the car doesn't, doesn't go down a road if there's five steering wheels. Ooh. Just doesn't work. No backseat drivers yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now again. What are the qualities about the Clarence, given that you've done so many other rivers? It's a very special river, this yeah. one, because I've kind of moved into the old fart category. <laughs> Join the gang. <laughs> so that, you know, the Yahoo kind of yeah, yeah. short, sharp, shock rafting doesn't do it for me anymore, and multi day rafting's where it's at, as far as I'm concerned. The, yeah. the journey yep. through the gorges and the open country and. It is a bit of an unusual environment for New Zealand. Mm. I actually think it's even a bit drier than central Otago in here. Yeah. And it can definitely be hotter. Right. <laughs> That's for sure. But it's, there's so few people in here. The isolation mm. is a special thing and pretty amazing scenery, like being in this valley between these two ranges that are so uplifted yep. and you know being smashed down and lifted up and yep. at the same time. But at the same time, the mountains are lifting up. The river is working its way down. Mm. Phenomenal geology down right. through here. Like and we and obvious, because there isn't forest. Very mm -hmm. obvious, yeah. yeah. You are going from an alpine environment to the beach. The and there's actually quite a lot of history down here as mm. well. You know, the remnants of forest that used to be way high up in some of the gullies that we'll see. Probably more tomorrow than today. We'll yep. see those yep. Yep. way high up. OK, everybody paddle forward, please. Going. Bit of a bump here. Okay, stop. Very nice. No, I'm obviously passionate about rivers. This is yeah. what I do, this is what I love. And there are a group of people in this country that are the same. But it's a small group mm. that, you know, it's, it's actually a small voice, which is a pity. But I think in recent years it's becoming louder. Like a lot of people, there's rivers they used to swim in when they were a kid and mm. you can't swim in them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can't drink them anymore and all that kind of stuff. So people are like, oh. Yeah, wake up oh. cool. The rivers are the arteries and the veins and mm -hmm. of, of the land. Are we about to approach a rapid here, are we? Well, I think we might be, yeah. That, do you think we might need to do something Do you yet? think that require me to paddle? I think, yeah. <laughs> shall I pull out that dictator kind of <laughs> I shall listen. Oh, OK. <laughs> Um, I was stuck. We're stuck, right. <laughs> Bounce up and down a little bit. Very strange way to get down a river. Yeah, yeah. OK, doing another method. Yeah, just keep bouncing up where you're right. This is where the autocrat goes to work for us. Yeah. <laughs> the roles are somewhat reversed here, Bridget. They do, they do get to be a bit like that. I can enjoy yeah. this side of it a little more. Not all good being a dictator. <laughs> no, no. Okay, paddle forward, please. 
Just when the Clarence was seemingly over placid, she surprises us with a more challenging stretch. OK, that's good. Stop. Very nice. And that's one of the truly enjoyable things about a raft trip. You never quite know what to expect around the next bend. We're starting to come into the first big gorge on the Clarence, and I really like getting into gorges. There's something almost like a, a vortex feeling that you're being sucked in, and, and quite quickly the rocks are reared up. That's beautiful. I'm, oh, I want to get a shot here, definitely. Yep, camera. This section of the gorge is remarkable for the way the strata are exposed, clearly showing the different layers of rock laid down over the millennia. Some photographers do that, they spend hours setting up, they pre-visualise the language, they work out the whole shot. I tend to sort of go for it. You've been involved in water politics, the conservation of water, protection of water for many, many years. What's it like to actually be on a river? Quite different from sitting in front of the computer, writing submissions or appearing in front of resource consent hearings. I mean, we, do you get onto rivers very often? Not as much as I'd like, and yeah. this trip's amazing for that, yeah. because it's a lot of interacting with people who are making decisions yeah. who may not have experienced the rivers like this. Mm. I think with the water conservation orders, you've actually got to get the court to go and do a trip down the river. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that they can have a little bit of the experience. Mm. Otherwise, it is just talking about the, the science a lot, but unless someone's been there, they can't really understand it. Are we starting to get a bit of protection around them that, that we didn't previously have? Because we have in the past treated them as a little bit of a ditch, really, haven't we? But... Well, there have been some big campaigns in the past, in the 80s, for rivers like the Rakaia. But I think with the Clarence, you've had the landscapes of the river going from not being managed to protection to being much more recognised for their um, ecological values and just this massive sweep of country. Yeah. And it's a different river from others because you haven't got any major irrigation, mm. um, no major hydro plans. So it's wild and it's free. And being wild and free, you have to watch where you're going. This is one of the trickiest rapids on the Clarence. It's called the Chute. The river here has carved a channel through the bedrock to make a narrow gorge. When the river's high, this section of the gorge can be too dangerous to navigate. So often, rafters have to get out and carry their vessels downstream. Luckily, the river's running low at present, so we're going to try our luck. There's a narrow channel to negotiate between the rocks. And it's quite a relief to make it through in one piece. <laughs> oh, it's wild stretches of river like this that lure whitewater kayakers like Ben Jackson. I feel safer in the raft somehow, but ironically, Ben is also here to help pick up anyone who falls overboard. Oh. We've made it through the hardest rapid on the river, and luckily Ben's services haven't been required. This is uh, Ben, our safety kayaker. Hi, Ben. <laughs> oh, great. Now, this little thing you're going to... Uh, Save us if we uh, fall out in the in the rapids, huh? Well, if you play your cards right, maybe. <laughs> but how, how are you going to save us on this? I mean, this isn't long enough to swing a cat on. Well, you can if you try, but all I can typically do is just fire you on the back there. And, oh, yeah. Or maybe sometimes offer a little bit of coaching on your swimming. Coaching? <laughs> coaching, yeah. You just seem to be completely at home on the rivers, the way you just paddle around and just get in those little eddies and work it all. Um, but I guess it's not always straightforward. No, it's, it's not, you know, and different people like different things. And for me, I, I really enjoy the challenge of paddling difficult rivers. And you've got rivers here that can really challenge you physically and mentally, and there's a lot of objective danger, so you can get out there and 
I guess, uh, really pit yourself against the environment. And then we've also got a lot of beauty here as well. So mm -hmm. a, a trip like the Clarence, where it's more about the journey as opposed to you know, the rapids as such, where you get to traverse the landscape and you know, move through an environment. With our camp set for the night, it's time to sample the local drop. With many of our waterways now polluted with bugs like Giardia, there are very few rivers still safe enough to drink from. But I'm betting the Clarence is one of them. Pure Clarence, 2010. Couldn't be better. Ah, oh, yeah. Good way to end the day. I'm midway through my raft trip down the majestic Clarence River, and I'm taking time out to visit the only farmers in this remote landscape. Hi. Hi. Colin, is it? That's right. Yeah. Craig. How Good to you? meet you, yeah. Tina. How'd you go? Yeah. Colin and Tina Nimmo own one of the country's most isolated farms, Muzzle Station. Got a few grapes on the vine. This was once described as the loneliest sheep station in New Zealand. It's the only inhabited farm on this mountainous middle section of the Clarence, and it's been in operation for 150 years. The old Cobb homestead dates back to 1860. Muzzle is a working farm, so Tina soon puts me to work. So we're going to milk Aggie the cow. Yes, Tina. How old's Aggie? Um, nine or ten, I suppose. Have you done a lot of cow milking? Not a lot of cow milking, Tina. In fact, it was a long time ago on Durval Island I once milked a cow, but I do like cows and I do like milk. I'll tie a leg up in case she might kick you singing different. There you go. 101. Just pull. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it. Well, she's doing it, actually. I'm uh, just an accessory to it. How many cows do I have to do today, by the way? Just one. <laughs> but this is your milk supply, or do you buy milk in? No, I don't buy milk very often, unless I haven't got a cow. And you brought your children up on this cow milk? Yes. And how many children you brought up? Two. In the belly? And do they come back? One's still here. Well, yep. they're both still here. Really. Yep. One is here permanently with her husband of a month. All right. And the other one, they run our bee business over, yep. over there in the bee house, and they live in Darfield. But they've oh, just okay. been here doing all the honey harvesting. How has the river affected your life? I mean, it, it's been a very central part, I guess, just living here with the river. We play in it, swim in it, fish in it occasionally. Uh, we work stock over it, and we drive over it when we can. Mm. We watch it every day. We, you know, we always go out there and have a look at the river. People ring up to see how big the river is or what's happening. It's, oh, it does play a huge part in our lives. Have you been worried about the children, you know, sort of drowning yes, in the river? Yes, they did. In the old days they did. We actually told them the river was, was horrible almost. Right. So they always treated it with respect and we but, never had really any incidents. Oh, OK. Yeah. They used to go down there, but mm. they used to harass rafters. That was did they? They, mm. they harassed them? We found that out. What, throwing rotten apples at them or what? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, there's thousands of people raft down that river every year, I think. Well, I know. Right. They do. So the river brings most people to you, I guess. Oh, there's all sorts of funny people turn up at the house. <laughs> do they? Yeah, when you least expect it. Yeah, right. you, you get used to the ones from the river because they're wearing funny clothes. But when we first came, we thought we lived in the middle of nowhere and then, then the, these people would sort of suddenly appear. This is a very remote location. I imagine it's not for everyone. What are the biggest changes you've seen in the valley over the years? When we came here, we had no radio, we had no TV, we had nothing. We didn't have a telephone either. <laughs> now we've got the whole lot. Internet, telephones, radio telephones. So. Yeah, we had no communication really wow. at all. That's, so if something went wrong, that would have been a bit more serious in those mm, days. Very. If the daughter got ill. She's given us a very... Oh, we've done very well. Yeah, lovely lot of milk, look at that. Let's go take it to the fridge. I've got enough for morning tea, but there's a mob of sheep to shift with the Nimmo's daughter Fiona and her husband Guy. The Clarence is very, very central to this farm and obviously to your lives. I mean, how does it affect you and what sort of ways does the Clarence affect you? Well, it's good in a way for, obviously, for stock with water, but it's a bit of a natural boundary as well for sheep. I mean, they can't cross it, but right. we have to watch with cattle, they cross it. But oh, okay. Just learn to live with it. And it's, it's a pretty handy thing though, I it's suppose. It's another thing that controls our life. Like yeah. when it comes up, we can't go out because we can't get over it. So if the river's up and the weather's bad, you can't fly and you can't drive, so you can't go anywhere. How do you actually get the sheep and the cattle over the river? Do they just swim across? They're happy to do it? Cattle swim and um, when we have to take sheep across on the way out to Kaikoura, we um, truck them. You truck them across yeah. the river? Yeah, no, we've, we've tried swimming them in the past and usually ends up in it's a, not much a fun. Or, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 
they react to they don't like it. Yeah, they don't like it. So what, what is it so special about this place that's, that's brought you back? For me and for Guy, it's like work-wise, it's our dream job. Right. Because that's what we like, dogs and horses and the hills and being alone and it's nice. Um, and here especially, it's got such a unique lifestyle. And would you like to stay here all your life? Can you imagine yourself retiring, riding off into the sunset here? Oh, I'd definitely stay here as long as I can. Yeah. yeah. This looks a bit like controlled chaos. Do you, do you see it that way, or do you know oh, what you're doing? Oh, you know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're separating yeah. out the lambs. Yeah, just little ones from the big ones. A lot of my friends say, oh, we really love where you live, but we could never live there. You know, a few people, they get here for a couple of days and they start getting yeah, cold feet. They've got to get out, they've got to get away, because they can't, they can't cope with the idea of, of being sort of almost trapped, but it doesn't feel trapped to me at all. The reality of living in such a remote area is that it isn't always easy to get in or out. When the river's at its highest, the road out becomes impassable for up to three or four months at a time. To go this way out onto the inland road, we've got to cross the river, so from spring through till possibly December, it can be too high to get a truck, oh, really? truck across or a big tractor. Um, so we can't get our wool out if we share in September, we can't get it out till December sometimes, which is a hassle. Um, you ever got stuck in the river? Yeah. Are you going to tell us about it? Or is that oh, a secret? <laughs> no, there's been plenty of vehicles stuck. Uh, not so much this machine, um, mainly because we haven't got a lot to pull it out, so you're reasonably careful that you don't head in there with something. It's going to come in through my toes soon, isn't it? Yeah. Aren't we getting down to that level? Oh, no. They tell me in the army that these things will go with the water halfway up the windscreen, so... Yeah. <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. If you had to choose between a unimog and a horse in a flooded river, what would you choose, Colin? A horse. A horse? Yeah. Because? A good horse will go in the river, head across it, push into it, and you can get into some pretty deep stuff. It's as long as you're careful that you've, you can go downstream and get a way out, as long as you're not going to end up in a, up against a cliff or something when you go downstream. So, I mean, in, on balance, the river, do you love it or hate it or a bit of both? Oh, no. No, you'd, it'd be a, a dismal place without it, really. I mean, you get this dry land, it gets pretty depressing for stock, people, dogs. Everything wants a drink of water and... Uh, you know, the river's always there, you can look down and you feel a lot cooler and happier when you see the water. It's a spectacular morning on the banks of the Clarence River. Time to say goodbye to our hosts, the Nimos from Muzzle Station. Oh, absolutely wonderful, yeah, great time. For this leg of the journey, we're joined by Channel Courtney, one of New Zealand's leading plant scientists. And with the river looking fairly calm today, a strange urge takes me. I'm going to see if Geordie, he's in charge, will let us have a go on the mothership. This is, this is the raft that carries all the gear, the important gear. Geordie's very much in charge, but hey Geordie, I think I could try a row today. Oh, you'd be lucky. <laughs> yeah, but... Very lucky. We'll see what we can do, though, and yeah. now we'll sort something out. Very cool. Yeah, no problem. Just before we go, mate, you've got a lovely tattoo there. What's yeah, that sure. all about? I'd love to see it. Well, it's just uh, five mountains. Oh, yeah. We've got uh, Te Pua'u Nuki, uh, we've got Manukau, Te Awhikari, Mount Fife and uh, the Kaikoura Peninsula, uh, the Waiatoa River, and um, got me and my dad, the two tiny far down the bottom, yeah. and my family over the over on the left. So it's all about your association with the river. Yeah, it's just we've been brought up. Oh. What do I have to do? What do I have to know? So you ride a dinghy? I ride a dinghy. It's about the same except backwards. <laughs> except backwards. Yeah. Well, it's not too hard. Okay. Jump these on. are slightly bigger oars than yeah, a dinghy monsters, oars, my friend. Monsters, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did pump it up a bit of muscle, do you think? Yeah, it might help. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good trip. This is all yours, boss. Do I face yeah. this thing downstream? This yeah, way? You would, yeah, yeah, you, you want to put it down, downstream. Yeah, right. No, I mean... We'll see what happens. No, I mean, which is I'm gonna the front? See, I'm going to let you do what you want. It's not right quite on. like growing a dinghy, but I reckon I'll get the hang of it. It's going to be pretty tight down here anyway, so just give it a go. Yeah. Get those paddles moving through. So, uh... Oh, you're doing all right. All right? Yeah. See you later. Fantastic. Great trip. Thank you. 
I think you want to go right of the big rock and right. left of the small rock. Right of the big rock, left of the yeah, small rock. Yeah, it's going rock. hard work. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that encouragement, my friend. I think I've gone right onto the rock, Joy. Yeah, no, you've done pretty well. <laughs> Hold on there for a sec, we'll see what we can do. Go gone on. all of 50 metres. Look at that. You are right, and we got stuck already. Maybe in my navigation, maybe just a difficult part of the river. Is all yours, Craig? Yeah, thank you, Geordie. At this point, I'm starting to regret my yeah, bravado. Like white water coming in. I could be just taking a leisurely back seat with the rest of my crew. Hey, but why not? These are big oars, Geordie. They are very big oars. They are bigger than that dinghy that I told you about. So you've had a long association with the river? Yeah, yeah. The old man bought the company 11 years ago. OK, and that's when you started working on it? And Well, I was only 16, so... Yeah, <laughs> you were only 16. No. So, I mean, how many times have you gone down this river, mate? Um, well, I think it's about 45. 45? 40 to 50. Over how many years? Uh, oh, my first trip was 2002. Yeah. So, yeah, whatever that is, eight years, I guess. Eight years on the road. Yeah. Same river. Every summer? Yeah, every summer since 2002 I've been down. Wow. And you love it? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I still love it. Yeah. Watch out for these rocks. Yep. So just working on that forward pedal on one side, backwards on the other. <laughs> Oh, yeah, thanks, mate. That's better. Thank you. Now we hold it up. Even us greenhorns can learn a bit. Yeah. Jordy, there's a lot you taught me in a short period of time. Yeah, well, you've been on 20 minutes, so. Yeah, and? Yeah. Oh, you're going all right. I mean, a mark out of 10? Come on, talk uh, about seven. There is actually Six a launch coming up, though. There um, is. While I'm no, ahead, you're I'm going up. down. <laughs> You're about four That's now. That's the thing, while I'm ahead, so you can get out I, of might, here. I might give these oars back to you, yeah, mate, three, and go back to a paddle. Two. Oh, oh, yeah. right, very oh, well. Yeah. OK. There we go. That was my experience on the oars. And uh, after scoring highly in the early stages, I've just flunked right out of class. The Clarence runs along the Alpine Fault between two great mountain ranges, the inland and seaward Kaikoras. The Kaikoras are our fastest growing mountain ranges. They've been pushed up over 2,000 metres in the last five million years. So it's little wonder the land looks wild and rugged, with nothing smoothed over. It's a relief to be back on my usual raft once again, with other paddlers to share the load. And Channel is right in his element. This is one of those um, hot spots for um, plant endemism. Like, so endemism is where plants are confined to. So there's a whole bunch of plants that are confined to this region and only here. And right. uh, they're amazing plants. They're not, you know, not little demure things. They're right in your face plants. Oh, like yeah. some of the brooms, you yeah, mean? Like some of the like, pink brooms, yep. which have been passing here. Yep. And um, the rock daisies, only found here in Marlborough. How many plants have you found here that are Well, special? we passed Limestone Hill just back there, and there's a um, new um, native aniseed to mm. that hill, only found there, which I discovered in, probably about 12 years ago. That's so it hasn't been named yet. Must have yeah. felt pretty cool just finding your own plant. <laughs> <laughs> and are these plants safe, or are there threats to them in any way? or? Well, a lot of them are actually um, just relics of what they used to be because, because of fire mainly. And um, we've got competition big time with um, all these introduced plants through here. Mm. And we've got a lot of browsing animals too, goats and deer. But there was one huge browser that walked through here naturally, the mower. That must have had a huge yeah, impact on the, yeah. on this, the vegetation. This was mower country. Yeah. There's been mower bone deposits found further in upland and uh, Molesworth Station. So we know they were here. So yeah, just imagine this country full of big hulking mowers pushing through the scrub here like bulldozers. Yeah, yeah. This was a forested landscape. It looks drier than it actually is. We're getting about 600 millimetres of rainfall here. Mm. So um, it looks like a desert, but the fires actually wiped out the forest. So there'd be mud eye here originally. Mm. A lot of halls torture it all over the fat country. Yeah, we do see little remnants, don't we? Yeah, yeah, so there's the odd bit still left. They're just the signatures of what we used to have way mm. more mm. common. Of the 60 species that occur only here, half of them are threatened, and a lot of those are quite small plants. So mm. it's just getting people familiar with what they are and what their values are. Mm. And, and they are taonga, they're part of our natural heritage. So, you know, we have a responsibility to protect them, just as we do the kobe and the kōwhai and the mm. yeah. yeah, And the birds. Yeah. And the birds, yeah. yeah. I'm leaving the river with plant expert Channel Courtney to head up country to the top of the Chalk Range, which will give us a great overview of our journey. But 
What a view. What a magnificent view of the way we've come. The river lies in the middle there, the Clarence River. The inland kaikouras on one side, the seaward kaikouras on the other side. And furthermore, for the first time, we're getting a glimpse across here of the ocean at the end of our journey. But we're not here just for the scenery. This is one of New Zealand's biodiversity hotspots with around 10 plant species that aren't found anywhere else. Hey, what have we found here, Shan? Okay, this is um, one of the um, chalk range endemics. It's a chalk gentian. Okay, only found here in good numbers, actually, but only found on this limestone belt. Many of the other ones are really rare. And uh, one plant which I'd hope to show you is the chalk cress, which when we first surveyed for it, we'd only known it from a dried specimen that had been collected years ago. We've got about 40 individuals now, so it's still incredibly rare. That's less than the kākāpō. I mean, should we be protecting it and valuing it as much as we value the kākāpō? Well, 40 individuals, incredibly vulnerable to extinction, yes. Yeah, mm. Our responsibility is to try and um, protect that from going extinct. It's highly palatable, OK. Um, we've got to pr legally protect the habitat at some stage, and we have to make sure that um, we don't have the place overrun with weeds. So they are the three main things, really. Are we likely to find species not yet known to man? Yeah, we are. We are? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's still happening now. Yeah. Um, in fact, just last year there was a publication um, of a native Daphne from this chalk range, which we hadn't known about before. We, as a nation, are a biodiversity hotspot on the planet, being mm. recognised as such because of the distinctiveness of our mm. plants and our animals. So we're pretty special internationally. On the way back from the Chalk Range, I stop in on one of the most remarkable geological features to be found in this part of the world. We're in the Mead Stream. That's a tributary of the Clarence, a small tributary, but with an absolutely mighty story, because that rock up there tells the story of the demise of the dinosaurs. It's 65 million years old, that rock. And lying in that rock is a thin layer of iridium. That came here from a massive meteorite that plunged into the sea at the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and created this big cloud of iridium, a nuclear winter cloud that encircled the whole Earth and caused species to go extinct, like the dinosaur. In fact, half the species of life that we know of at that time went extinct. And it's marked here, probably better than anywhere else in the world, in this sedimentary rock. Clarence is one of the windier rivers in New Zealand. It started out heading south from Lake Tennyson, then east, then northeast through the two Kaikoura ranges. It's about to do a big loop, cutting a gorge through the seaward Kaikouras before heading south once again to the coast. As we head into the last stretch of our journey, I ask you, Janie Sage, what's special about the Clarence from a water conservation point of view? There isn't any major irrigation from this river. It is a wild river. We see its full flow. The Rangatata, a uh, third of the flows diverted into the Rangatata Diversion Race. The Rakaia, major diversions from that. So these braided rivers, like sections here, uh, we're stealing too much water and not giving enough back to the river in terms of protection of the natural values through weed control, predator control, uh, just sustaining its life force. Water conservation orders are the equivalent of national parks for the rivers. There's not one on the Clarence, there should be. One of the really nice things is that the country we've travelled through, most of it has come into protected ownership just in the last few years. 2005, Molesworth Station became a recreation reserve, and now these last couple of days we've been going through the Kaikoura Conservation Park, again, just created in the last two or three years. So, you know, Forest and Bird and Federated Mountain Clubs and other conservationists and recreationists put this effort into setting aside this landscape for nature conservation and for recreation, and what better way to enjoy it? We're into the last big gorge before the river opens out and runs to the sea. And Channel's keen to take some plant specimens back for research. So what do you got here? Well, this is one of the native Daphnes. That, um, we've got about 40 species in New Zealand. And this one will be um, one that's confined to these Marlborough limestones. So it'll be another rare one. 
It's probably one of the few plants I haven't actually seen yet in Marlborough, so it's, it's a good day for me. We're on the homeward stretch now and the final paddle downstream. And it's with some regret that I pass under the Clarence Bridge and State Highway 1. But as we hit the coast, we're in for a very special welcome. The rocks of the river, the river stones that are still here today come from the high mountains behind us and we've picked a number of them for you and we'd like to give them as a gift by way of saying thank you very much for carrying the kaitiaki, the guardianship of this place, of this land, of this river. The South Island Māori tribe, Naitahu, has a deep attachment to the river they call the Waiatoa and strong concerns about its future. We've got concerns with all the major rivers in the South Island. We look at everything as having a life force. A river has a life. Mankind comes along and tries to make nature work to its way as opposed to us working with nature. Mm. And until we learn to get back in balance, we're always going to have issues with the river. We have a saying, mō tātou, mō kauri a muri ake nei. Everything we do is for ourselves and our children after us and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So we want our kids able to come here to fish, to swim, to look at what is here, mm -hmm. not have it changed by mankind. After 40 years, I've finally achieved a long-held dream to travel the length of the Clarence, the Waiatoa, from source to sea. And with its stunning natural beauty and rare wildlife and geology, it's been everything I hoped for. Now while I sit on the coast, I kind of think that you don't really do a river. It's not something I can just tick off and say, well, I've done that, what next? It's funny, the more I go back to these places, the more I want to return to them again and again. <laughs> <laughs> 